Oh, today I want to move on to looking at the subject of knees and knee strikes, and this is the only big category. So we've got like some miscellaneous news we want to look at. This is the, the big strike category that we're missing so far in the things that we've looked at. And there's a few interesting things around this, as always. One is how well it builds onto the, the discussion that we've been having around articulated movement and the idea of creating bigger movements in smaller spaces and how that recontextualizes our understanding of the concept of smallest movement for for biggest amount of power and that also helps to understand some of this stuff critically where where that's been misunderstood and it's kind of been well let's just be frank about it it's just it's just been adapted by charlatans into a, a means of swindling other people out of their gas money and you've got people who are just going like that and people flying back and well one of the interesting things about that is people thinking well that's the smallest possible you know a tiny tiny movement creates a massive ridiculously massive amount of power and that's one way of using this idea of the the smallest possible movement for the for the maximum amount of power of course where that leads to is nowhere it can never be demonstrated in any kind of genuinely live environment or against anyone who doesn't just go along with it. So we, as Zhao Gaozin says, that does rather raise some suspicions, but it certainly helps us understand that the same idea can be understood in multiple different ways and everything really depends on you and how you want to understand it. Those people who feel insignificant in this world and are seeking some means of empowering themselves through magical powers will always interpret stuff like in that way that you can achieve that kind of thing and and it just never ends it just i just i don't i don't know what could possibly end it because that's all about the individual themselves and they live within their own world where they want that so much that to give it away would be just it would break their hearts so leave them to it but other people are interpreting things in ways that lead to real practical outcomes and this is what particularly yao zong zong talks about you know you have to think about it like this if you're going to interpret a concept, interpret it in a way that leads to an actual improvement of level. And that's a very useful intellectual tool to engage with. And that's that's what leads to actual real development. On the other thing about that, of course, that kind of magic power thing, I was thinking like, because I was, I think the last video I did was doing quite late and I was, as is my want, started talking about daft things like moving elephants and things like that. Well, if you can do that, if you can just go like that and someone will fly back, why can't you do that to an elephant? Like a human, if, if that skill is real, then a human being should be able to do it to an elephant, just go like that and the elephant should ping back. What difference would it make how big the other person is if that's, if that's all it is? But the important thing is that this idea of the, the most power for the smallest movement has been perverted. And what I'm talking about in terms of articulated force and the way that we use screwing force and articulated movement creates more movement within a small within a small space. That's the real thing. That's the real thing. That's the thing that works. So we know it's the real thing. It's the thing that works. And it's also significantly more sophisticated than some ridiculous fantasy that you can make an elephant fly away by. <laughs> I ain't never seen an elephant fly, you know, it's that, isn't it? So that idea feeds in very much today to what we want to talk about in terms of knee strikes. And it also, I know that like knees are, like all kinds of leg techniques, require a different level of athleticism. Not everyone can necessarily risk, for example, doing high kicks and things like that. You know, it relies a lot in terms of flexibility and your personal athleticism. But nevertheless, the, the well, some of the kicks definitely most people most people can benefit from practicing some of the stuff around this. But intellectually, it really helps us understand this concept of generating more space in a small space, generating more movement in a small space, and therefore to get more power, and helps us understand this contradiction and how it functions. And that's the other thing that I saw. So saw someone arguing about. Well, it's just this, this thing that happens all the time where you've got people talking about Farley or Fargin and they say, well, Farley is, you know, Fargin. It's just anything, anything where someone someone hits with power. And then you've got other people saying, no, well, then, then nothing is Farley, is it? It's just, it's just a completely redundant term for hitting with power and it's not the Chinese term for hitting with power. So why would you even use that? 
And what's missing always from those discussions is something that I've hammered home. Just, just I think every video I probably hammer it home that Yao Zong Zong gives us, and this is the idea of the real. Well, it's not just Yao Zong Zong. It's it, Wang Shenzhai talks about this. The reality of the context of the fight. Zhao Daozin talks about this. You know, the nitty gritty of the fight. Everything's got to be based around actual fight training, and and. And Wang Shenzhe is very specific about this, that everything's based around fight training. And even if we're thinking in terms of health, these are like side benefits from... We can break it off and help some people with some of the stuff that we do. So we can look at health another time. But for to say that you practice each one, it's about fight training. And everything's within the reality of the context of the fight. Added on to that then is that not just any, any techniques used in a fight, but quintessence principles of Wushu. So when we add those things together, we've got the reality of the, con the context of the fight, we've got the quintessence principles of Wushu. When we add those things together, then Far Li isn't just anything. It isn't just hitting with force. It's a real thing. Whether it's a special thing, whether it's better than other things, that's a whole different question, but it's a real identifiable specific thing and that's what I've been talking about. In fact, it's a science and that's what we've been looking at. The, the art and the science of of using Farley. And it's based on these, these really important principles, one of which is maximizing the amount of movement in a posture, even though it looks like a small movement. And that's why we're doing things like screen force. And one of the ways that we know that, that these things are true, one of the ways that we can identify that is it starts cracking open everything else, that it starts revealing all mysteries. Each one, not as not as a not as a modern set of different schools all having to go at each other but each one has a as the quintessence principles of Wushu that as Wang Sheng Jai sees it's something ancient something that far predates Wang Sheng Jai himself each one in that sense is the quintessence of Wushu should reveal all mysteries so it reveals mysteries for example like well, when when we do this in in traditional Wushu when we have this hand coming back like this. I mean, everything's overdetermined, but one of the things that this does is it teaches you straight away about screwing force, that what this does is add more movement. So you can go like that to there, or you can go like that to there, but when you twist it like that, you add more movement, you add more movement for the same distance. That's like, the principle is far more important than the movement itself. And that's teaching us about screwing force. That principle is like the foundation of like most of what we're doing in each one. This is why Wang Sheng Jai sees it as embedded in, in traditional Wushu. It's just you've got to pick it out and it reveals all mysteries. And it's things like that, that where we understand that this is right. This is the real thing. It cracks open all mysteries. And another way of thinking about that is when we think about knee strikes, so moving into our idea of knee strikes now, that there's different ways of generating power and all those ways of generating power rely on physical movement they rely on physical movement they don't rely on some kind of I don't like I don't want to completely decry the idea and say that everything's just about physical movement or structure that's obviously not true in terms of our intent and the way that our intent links together with the body and things like will and courage determination anger wrath you know these things they can't necessarily be captured by science, but they nevertheless don't contradict science. So these things where, where people just go like that and people fly away and that kind of thing. I saw someone who'd written a book about an encyclopedia of Zhang Zhuang, and he's just one of these guys who's doing, he's going like that and some, some big bloke is flying away like that. Well, you should be able to do that to an elephant or something like that, should you? Good luck, good luck doing that. When you think about it like that, go on, go do that to a cow. Let's see you do that. You know, they can't do that. And all the bullshit starts coming out. Well, cows haven't got the same chi meridians. Oh, come on, come on. It's funny how antibiotics work the same on them though, isn't it? Um, so when we think about something like knee strikes, something like that, why would we even need a knee strike if you've got these kind of powers like that? You can just go like that and touch someone with your knee and then all your magic powers will go through like electricity. 
But it doesn't work like that, does it? In reality, to create real, real force, you've got to move. And there's different ways of moving. Um, but they all rely on the bigger the movement, the more power you can get. And it's a contradiction. I know that people have got to get their minds around in each one because we've got this idea of the most power for the smallest movement. But also we've got the idea of like movement within movement and movement within stillness. And once we get our mind around this contradiction, like lots and lots of things become clear, not least of all how to hit with real force with smaller seeming movements. And that's the way to start thinking about it smaller seeming movements and Yao Zongzun writes about this and one of his students writes about this particularly someone saying to Yao Zongzun like what like you hardly moved and, and he sent me flying and Yao Zongzun starts explaining like yeah to you it looks like I hardly moved but if you break down all the movement in my body there's so much movement going on it's just that I'm moving differently like using screwing force and articulated force adds so much movement into the posture you can't see it as we've talked about before. So think about, let's think about knee strikes now and let's think about one of the common ways of doing it. So let's, let's say we're gonna hit in to the side like this and we're gonna throw out and then in like that. I'm not saying do it like that, I'm saying this is a very common way of doing it. Like to throw out, throw out to the side, one, two, and then bring it in like that round and in like that and one of the things you think about that straight away is like yeah but that's just so you can get to the target you want to you want to hit in this way so you want to come in round like that so that you can get to the target but you can get on the bag yourself and see you don't actually need to do that never mind just doing it in, in sparring or something like that get them get them big sandar chest protectors on Chinese will choose about health preservation at the end of the day, not exploiting people in competition so you know so that other people can make money. That's always been the idea. Wang Shangjai, very interestingly, you can say that Wang Shangjai wouldn't have supported the UFC and he wrote very specifically about competitions where what he calls the big bosses exploit the athletes who are damaging their bodies to make money for the big bosses. It's quite interesting. So even in sparring, you can see you can come up quite narrow to get the knee in to the side like that. You don't have to come out like that to do it. That's not the reason that people do it like that. The reason is to get more space on it, to get more space on the movement, more size, so that you can get more power into the movement because the more movement, the more movement, the more power. That's the idea anyway. If the movement requires, you know, Velocity times mass, this, you know, our key equation, of course, it, it requires that you can get more velocity, you can get more power, but more bigger movement helps you get, helps you get more speed and it helps you get more power into that technique. Similarly, if we want to do, we've seen this kind of um, drop back like that, one, two, this kind of one, two posture, one, two, like that is quite common, I try not to. My intent is etronizing e everything. It's trying to move this leg to improve the power, but, but one, two, like that, you can get the, So you get the bigger movement on the, so you can get a bigger, you know, just like a big hate maker, just getting more swinging force on it like that. What's that doing? What's that doing when you do that? It's creating more movement. What were we talking about in articulated movement? Articulated power, creating more movement. What's this? creating more movement it's the same principle but it's expressed in different ways and this is what we mean by quintessence principles of washu we want that movement smaller this is all a lot to explain so we just say like smallest possible movement for the most amount of power we have to then break that down and work out what it means but we can only understand it as embodied knowledge and when we understand it as embodied knowledge we can start thinking about things differently so let's say I'm going to go one, two, like that. And that very much is using the power of the muscles in the leg. One, two, like that. But already I'm starting to just turn on my axis and just fishtail in the root a little bit like that. So let's say instead of going one, two, like that, like that, I just come straight up. I just come straight up and like that. But I get more around the axis. I get more movement around the axis and I use explosive force 
and I'm not, I'm not for one second saying that other people don't use explosive force when they do this kind of because it's an explosive movement. It's just a very particular way of moving, structurally articulated movement around the axis. That then what I'm gonna say is like if I can get more if I can get more articulated movement on the on this kick when I do it like this, on this knee strike, that I can get the same amount of movement if I compensate for the way I turn around my axis and release force and use farly that what I end up with in the end is the same amount of power as doing it like that. So if I go like that, you can hear it set pretty clearly on the back foot, like that, that I don't need to go like that. In fact, you can see the way I do it with like structural movement that very clearly becomes two movements, like, like I could kick out or something like that, like some, or, or block a kick or, and do it like that kind of movement. But I can just go straight in like that and compensate by getting more movement, more movement, particularly around the, the turn around the axis like that. It doesn't matter, even if you're holding someone, you can still get a turn around the axis like that to create more movement in the, in the posture. And I have to say, it's not a particularly complex thing. If someone's someone's doing postures like that it's quite easy actually to get them to just be a little bit more explosive in the turn around the axis and it's surprising this looks like nothing i know this like this turn around the axis but think about how much mass is being moved in that posture how much mass of the whole body and it's being moved very fast around that how much force that generates can i always say it's an optical illusion you can't it looks such a small movement but Actually, the power generation is, is significant. So let's say we think about instead the, the lead knee. And this is often a little bit different because usually, let's say, well, we see we see all kinds of variations, don't we? It's in every style, but it's quite common also to see the, the step back like that. And we do use that. You know, we use all steps, all footwork, all footwork in each one. But this wouldn't be our bog standard front knee training for us in each one so i'm going to kick into the side we want we want it just off the spot you see me using the oppositional force with with my hands as well sometimes you have to drill that out a bit that's your body wants to create as much force as possible so it will do you know your intent wants to create as much force as possible so it will do that visualizing like pulling someone on or sometimes you have to drill that out and just think, well, let's imagine I can't do it. <laughs> it's hard because your mind just, it's, it's the body naturally using oppositional force. And that tells us something really important about the laws of nature and how oppositional force works, that this isn't just like a made up principle. It's within the laws of physics itself. But my knee is going that way, or my arms are going that way. My body, for example, doesn't want to go like that with everything going the same way. That doesn't create power in the same way that that does. So this kind of closing, contracting force. So anyway, one way of doing this is to step back like the like that, which if we do that in each one, it's, well, certainly the way I do it, the way I teach it, that kind of movement is deliberate, that's a step. That's a step out of the way, like, like to avoid and then, then in or something like that. It's not done to generate power. Of course, it's sympathetic to the generation of power. So again, understanding these two very different ideas. If I'm here, I can use a spring off the floor to add power into it. So we never miss an opportunity to add more power, but that's not our basic bog standard way of kicking. What, what it does, of course, is it turns it into a back leg, turns it into a back leg kick. What we want is off the spot, off the spot front kick. And we want to generate force, but we, you see what's this doing also? It's creating more space, it's making a bigger movement to get more power. We want to create a bigger movement using articulated, articulated force, but some of the principles are slightly different in the way they express themselves with knee strikes. So I want to go straight up and I want to use this explosive movement that we've talked about off the 
push up with the like that. How many times, like in contemporary, contemporary or traditional wushu, it doesn't matter. Wushu is one art as far as I'm concerned. These postures where we do this kind of thing, like these showering or gods and everything, isn't it? With the foot pointing down. I said before, it looks just like an aesthetic thing. No, it's teaching. It's this principle of explosive movement using the articulation of the of the ankle to push up off the ball of the foot like that to get more speed in that movement where you lift like that. And that's exactly what we want in the like that. It's a bit different here where we just it's the same it's the same idea, but we don't put the heel on the floor. It just bounces back straight into the straight into the posture. So we want to be up. Up and then change in. We'll look at the mechanics more in a, look, in a moment. We want to get more movement in the whole body. We don't just want like that with minimal body movement. We want to keeping the body flat on. Or, you know, round like, or even like that. Or round. These are all ways of getting more movement on. They're all completely legitimate and they can all be brought into the each one paradigm. That's not what I'm saying. I'm discussing the principle, the principle of creating more movement through, for example, turning a little bit more around the axis, being a little bit more explosive, which, and, and the way that we set and root the posture, that allows us to get pop-up kicks. No, no setup, no swinging out and then in. We can completely eliminate all of that dead time by transferring that space creation into the body, back into the body. I know at first it sounds a little bit, a little bit woo, but this is creating big space. It's created space, big size of movement. It's making the movement bigger. We can take that away from here. We can just keep the foot here. We can transfer that extra space into the body in terms of how much it moves around. And just change it like that. And you can do, you can, you can combine, but you can combine both if you want, but then it's about our reality of the context of the fight and, quintessence principles of Wushu. What we're trying to do is eliminate dead time and develop teleportation movement. This key idea from, from Zhao Daozin, teleportation movement. We want to eliminate all of those things like that. We just want the strike point to go straight to the target without any excess movement, without any dead time whatsoever. We transfer, we transfer that away from being at the beginning of the movement like that and we transfer it into the movement itself so that as I'm actually lifting the that space is transferred into it's created in the body movement here while the technique is taking place I think that's actually quite straightforward it's not necessarily easy to do but it's straightforward conceptually and it's also brilliant it's also genius then there's just a couple of other things that we need to think about that are based around this principle that are very similar and I've talked about this idea before about the bottom leg moving when we when we do certain postures. It is possible, for example, just to be on this. And this, I think, plays like the most significant reason why you don't necessarily do it the way that I'm talking about, why you won't necessarily do it in other systems. It's to do with the way that the kick is or the strike is targeted. Because if you're going to go forward like that, which is very often the way it's done, and the leg stays where it is like that. If you do it like that and you train it like that, it's much harder to get this short, sharp movement, this release of force that we that we generally call Farley in each one. It's much harder to do it. So what I'm saying is what, it's what we call rolling on the limb that I've talked about before, that you roll on the limb and you come forward like that and you twist the foot like that. The way that it balances the body is odd like that. If we want to twist round, if we want to twist round very fast on our axis for Farley, it's an odd movement and it's it's got well it's not even poor, it's not even poor sympathy, poor structural sympathy. It's almost like negative sympathy, it mitigates against it. A bit like you know, leaning over your foot and trying to do a pivot route. It, generally speaking, it's got like negative sympathy, so where it's got negative sympathy, then usually it's dangerous one way or another. So if, we, so if we're normally going to, just going to do that, where we move forward like that, we've got to be really, really careful about how we do that posture. So 
we miss it. It can be done, it can be done, and I'll look at that in a moment, it can be done, but usually people don't train it because they're not training this explosive movement around the axis in the same way that we want it in each one. So what we normally do, something I've talked about before, is the foot comes back like, like that. And if I do that, again, this is this principle, you don't, you don't immediately see it, but what we're doing is creating more space. We're creating a bigger movement out of the same. So my feet are just gonna, let's say I just step forward like that, like that, but instead I just do it like that, I'm creating like, one foot is just going, one foot's width like that, one step's width. But if I do it like that, both feet, both feet have moved one step's width, both of them. So it's like double the size of the movement. You've got, you've got to kind of get your head around that and how that works. Even though the movement itself looks smaller, I've doubled the amount of movement, I've doubled the amount that's going on mechanically. That's just one step. This is one step, two step back like that. That does multiple things as I've talked about before. One it, one, it brings the leg under the body that balances it more. Second, it allows this fishtail rooting. It's like a slide root like, like that, where it just slides back into there. And then thirdly, it creates this brace. So it braces the the way that the posture is stacked, it braces it so that it's pushing back into the floor and supporting the target. And those three things link together into a compound movement. So, and it's on the spot. It's pretty much on the spot. It's not moving in like that. Now you can do it like that, no problem, like that. I can feel in myself in my own movement, it's not as powerful. You can hear it and you can hear it and you can see it. It's not as powerful. This stretches out here when you're out here. This is unbalanced on the your proper roll on the limb. You're dropping down too soon. So when people say things like, well, each one is short range, it's like, yeah, it's not really. That's a misunderstanding. But it's a misunderstanding of things like this, that the way that the way that particular movements like this function better in a smaller space like here it's set really heavy see and then you can't hear it set because I'm lean the point where I'm hitting where I lean forward you know with a step like that at the hit point my foot my heel is off the floor I can't set it back against the heel like that yes incredibly unsympathetic movement to, to try and do that with a step forward like that so when I'm hitting, when I when I just step in with the knee like that, I'm up on the ball of my foot. I can't set it back into the, the ground. So I can't solidify the posture. I've got that wobble because I'm on my because I'm on my uh, ball of my foot. So I can't transmit the force in the same way as I can when I just do it as a like that. You know, at the end of the day, like that, our first our first level of knee strikes is the idea that they're close range. Of course, in reality, they're not. There's, there's loads of examples now of people like, when someone's even just leaning in a bit like that, ah, people do big knee, big knee and hit them in the face. Using exactly the the idea I'm talking about, like, like that we don't necessarily, we can do it in each one, but the big step like that, you do it like that. And that usually takes a different, like it's about the rules that, that apply. And one of the rules is like the, the technique versus the target. So if you can hit someone in the face, clean with the knee. It's not going to matter that much if you're on the ball of the foot. We do see that kind of thing. And also, if you're going to do a big movement like that, you very often jump with it anyway. So a different rule comes into play. It's, it's what we call a floating root where if you push off the floor, that energy is still there in the floor. Even if the, at the point where you hit the target, your feet are off the floor, there's that gap. The energy is still in the technique. So. So it takes on a different set of rules that apply to it than just like a close range in to the body and stuff like that. So it's absolutely fine to do those bigger, bigger techniques with the big step in like that, but a different set of rules takes over. So this foot comes back. And you can even just practice like 
something like that. And this is the principle of like releasing force from any part of the body. And I've talked about before how these basic footwork techniques are actually the, they're examples of releasing force from any part of the body in their own right. And then we just, we link them together like, 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 like Lego bricks. <laughs> you see me set up the articulated movement there. See, I mean, it's all about, it's all about creating more movement. So if you start doing it like bigger like that, and after all, what is it you're seeing in things like in Tai Chi where you're seeing these big, big movements, and you're setting up these big articulated, big articulated movements, so that's creating more space like we looked at last time. What is Tai Chi? What's all this stuff? It's creating more articulated force behind a movement. So, but what we want to do in each one is kind of reduce it into the smallest, the most articulated force we can get in the smallest possible space is a better way of thinking about what we're trying to do than most amount of power for the for the smallest movement. So like that. And as I'm pulling back and fishtailing it out like that, this could be just hitting with this part of the <laughs> part of the leg like that. It's not very powerful. Like that. But if someone just grabbed your foot or something, you could change or something like that. They're on the floor. It's not a very powerful movement but it's really really not easy to do and it's not easy to set it right either so like that tiny tiny movements that look like nothing but i know from experience of teaching them like so some i can remember the process of learning how to do them and others i've just forgotten all of that and just i can't ever remember not being able to do it but if you can't do all these little release from, from every direction like that you can't do all these little nuanced movements so you've got to practice them but you can do versions, that's the important thing. So I'm just pulling it back like that. And of course now this has got more, it's got more sympathy for, particularly for going for this. I'm gonna go for the, the round kick like that. So opening, opening, and it's round like that. So it's got a lot of, it's got a lot of structural sympathy for the posture itself. And it's all just about the timing, because you can see that both these movements now, one's going like that, one's going like that. Think. Now imagine these as like governors around my central axis. So it's all about, this posture is all about how well I can turn around my central axis like that. And this idea that we've talked about outliers, like the shoulders, like being two weights around the central axis. When we move those fast, it creates the, remember it's like a virtual reality thing, the idea of the central axis. It makes everything rotate faster and more sharply around the around the central axis. That's exactly what's happening with these postures. Just like we do it with the somatic timing with the shoulders here, it's exactly the same thing. And we've got to get a similar relaxation in the overall quad area and the, the thigh muscles. Remember this idea when we're doing standing, it's like you want to pee, but you don't pee. And that's just a way of visualizing how you relax that area. That's exactly the feeling, yeah. Like that. And so it, these two swing round like that. And these are the two outliers, and they help us get more zing on the rotational farley around the axis, like that. And then everything else is just. So even just doing that, even just like. You don't even just want to pull your arms back like that to get more power because you can get a little bit more power by twisting them in like that. It's more movement. This everything moving and twisting like that is more movement within the same small. What what to outsiders looks like one small movement actually is actually much bigger movement. It's articulated with all this screwing force and this principle of articulated force takes on a slightly different manifestation when we do it with the kicks. It's not so it's not so obviously like you're moving different joints like that, but it's creating more space. And even as the like the articulation is quite hard to see because it's like this with the legs. You can almost see that like like it sets up the like that. Like one, two. So it's exactly the same kind of things as we might use articulation in any other part of the body, but it's a much more sophisticated ask 
and it requires a much higher level of cultivation in terms of your ability to use articulated movement throughout the whole body. Now I saw someone saying, you know, it's one of these people, one of these magic power charlatans saying like, well, you know, each one isn't about mere structure. It's like they understand structure on the most primitive level. I mean, they would say that, wouldn't they? Because they want you to believe they've got magic powers. They understand structure on the most primitive, imaginable level. This kind of structure, articulated movement and articulated force. Getting this fast movement. Look, see the legs go. It's just this. Just this, but if you was to just add that onto the end, like, like just figure of eight, figure into the posture like that. It's just that, but reduced to just that. <laughs> Did I make a funny noise, Trish? Did it sound like the going out noise? It wasn't. You've got to wait. Go on. Um, twist like that, but we just break it down into this. This little bit here it just slingshots there so the knees are pointing the opposite way like that so two things two things then now you know you've got to practice one is just pulling back like and the other is just try to get you can start like this figure of eight and then just think like I just I just want that bit I just want that initial bit I'm just gonna start doing a figure of eight with my hips Look, it's just like, you know what you would do in Tai Chi, it's exactly that movement. I just want this initial bit here. And that's what you're training in Tai Chi, by the way. Like, like, for example, when you're doing this kind of... Why are you doing this? And why are you starting out, like, particularly in Chen Tai Chi, you just start with the, the figure of eight movement like that. You're training exactly this. You're training articulated force, how to create more... A bigger movement within a smaller seeming space. It's exactly that. It's a quintessence principle of Wushu. You just want this little bit here. So you just practice that. Like that. And see, I'm starting to bring it. It's an articulated, it's an articulated movement because the, the first movement is kind of release force here. <laughs> But then you've got to, if you can do it like from, we can do a figure of eight like this and then just change. Now you're going to hit out with that, like that, and the legs go either way like that. One, two, and then break it down into just the, just that. Push forward and on an angle with your knee. So your knee just does a little circle like that. Like that, you can practice that. Then all you've got to do is one, two, do it slow like that. One, one, two. So as the as the knee comes round, as it starts point coming to the front part of the little circle, one, then you push up, use explosive movement off the floor from your foot. So compound, compound far away movement. They're all little like what Wang Shang Chai says, little landmines going off together creating one big movement. From here, when we get to here, we just spring up into the posture. And then this foot, it should just naturally come back like that into the fishtail root. And you just practice relaxed like that. And you just try and get it from, you start like this, so that you get it just one, to go that can be quite hard in itself so I have lots of times lots of exercises where we do that and it's called triggering the movement like when do i go when do i go like that and trigger the movement and it's and it's the same thing like because the next step from that is like just to do it from from stillness like that and go when do you trigger the movement and that can be really really hard there's, a, there's an idea in darts called the yips, and it means that you can't let go of the darts, and it's, a, it's an affliction that professional dart players get sometimes. They just can't let go of the dart. It's something to do with their intent. You can get the yips for these kind of, like, oh, I should have gone there. I should have wondered where I go. Or doing it in complete still. I've seen it happen. In fact, I've seen it happen multiple times. 
with students where they're right, complete stillness just like standing and then you just want to go on teleportation move and they're going I can't, I can't do it, I can't go like I can't move, like I can't it, it can paralyse people like so we cut, like some exercises we try and do I mean the basic exercises is standing and visualisation and then what we call pulse induction where you just, you just kind of trigger the trigger the movement or like that um, well, there's different kinds of pulse induction, but that's one. Or I stand behind someone, and when I hit the shoulder, then you then you've got to go as fast as you fast as you can just to try and train this this out. But for us, first we do it one, so we can really feel that one slingshot into the movement like that. Of course, we don't usually want to be doing that. We haven't got time to do that. So then we just want, broadly speaking, off the spot. This is the hardest, off the spot. No movement first. Like that, straight into the, straight into the kit. Like that. And then it becomes easier again because then we can just bring it into movement. And we can use our movement to, to both disguise and also, as I've said, with jam, we're one of the things that we're practicing. And one of the reasons that we see this kind of movement in in trauma, where the guard is moving like that, it's always talked about in terms of being like insect antennae, and uh, Kenichi Sawai particularly talks about it like that. And you can see that the Taiki Ken people will very often do this. It's very like, yeah, and there's something to that, like, like, so before, like particularly in the hours each one, that's, that's got broken down and minimised a lot more because it's not actually all that helpful to, to be having these hands out here because you don't know where they're. It doesn't actually make it easier to predict any random thing if you're doing this than just having them closer like that. You can still get to wherever you need to be just as fast, but this is better for just guarding the upper body area and just dealing with the most likely things like, that we want to do, like take down the guard and stuff like that. But the other thing that this does do, and that's why you still see it in Yao's each one, but in, in a truncated, significantly truncated form, is it sets up these little articulated moves. So I can be like that, and I can hide, I can hide this slingshot movement behind the, like if I go like, like that, like that I can hide it behind the movement and I can be setting up how I'm gonna how I'm gonna move with the and put more space in the pot. So it's a way of adding more volume. Think about it like that. It adds more volume to the posture. It's a bigger posture for a like if we do it like I'm gonna do I'm gonna do one, two, three, like that. That's far too slow. That's far too slow for a we don't want all that, we just want straight into it. But if I do it while I'm moving, then that first setup part is in the, it's just in my movement, it's just in my guard movement like that. That's positive and negative, of course, like it adds more volume, makes the strike more powerful. Yeah, if you've got time to do that, we very often have anyways, we're just, we're in the flow, what's our sparring, something like that. And we've got, we've got time to move. And we can very often, we've got loads and loads of options because of the, the nature of the, the structural movement paradigm. We've got tons of options from, if, we, if we're setting up a posture like this, you know, I could go for a punch, could go for a knee, it doesn't really matter. There's loads and loads of options anyway. But we also need to be able to react very, very fast in a split second. So we also need it just like, just like if we're going there, even if we're going the other way, to be able to change back into that. So we need both. So it's positive and it's negative. It, it's negative in the way that you can see in a lot of each one schools that they're creating volume all the time to add more power. And they're creating this very big, whatever it is that, And actually, these are very big setups. And when you're just waving your arms about on the air, it doesn't matter that much. When someone's punching you in the face, you need your movement to be much smaller. You haven't got, well, he's punching me in the face, so I'm going to do a big setup like this to hit him, 
to hit him like that. And that's why you never really see those people doing it when they're sparring, because it just doesn't work like that. These are too big. They're too, they're, they're, like not big, too big in terms of the arms. That's another question, like that someone can come through your guard. The size of the movement itself, how much time it takes to do the movement. We want to compress all of that. So we want to create more volume, but we want it in a compacted space, like a spring winding, you know? There's a lot of wire, but it's going into a smaller space. So if someone's punching me in the face, I want to knee them. I haven't got time to do to do that, to knee. Punch me in the face, I just want to go straight for it like that when I'm sparring. But the danger is, if you don't really do sparring, and you're just doing it on the air like this. I can really set it up and I can really get loads of power with really big volume on the articulated movement. We want that volume compacted, in fact, in reality. No one's punching you in the face to punish you if you do it like that. So again, it's how we know this is right because it reveals all these mysteries. It just, it breaks it apart scientifically and tells us what's going on and what's wrong and what's right. And it all makes complete sense and it all works. Try it yourself, you know, sometimes the way I explain things isn't, it's not always super duper helpful, that's because I don't lesson plan. <laughs> or I have a vague idea what I want to talk about, so sometimes I think like, could have explained it better, but I think it's fairly, it's fairly clear. You can do big setups, can't you, if there's no opponent, you're not sparring. You can do massive setups for movements. If you're just training on the air, you can go, <laughs> like that, do a big setup. But if someone's punching you in the face and you start doing that, then you're just getting booted, aren't you? And that's exactly the same thing that's happening when people are just training on their own, like, doing that. But nevertheless, one of the things that that does teach you is how to integrate the articulation of the movement and bring some of the volume into your stepping before the actual hip posture. So it's positive and it's negative. It depends how you use it. The cure for all of that, of course, is like just to do loads of sparring and just think really practically about the reality of the fight. It's as simple as that. So for the, that's for the back leg. So for the for the front leg, it's a slightly different, slightly different rule. These are all going in that way for the moment. The back leg pulls in like that. So that's like if we do that posture on its own, like really drop down into it like that. Use down to. Release force that way. And again, that's not that easy. When we do it with a knee, we don't use down so much like, like that. That's because the way we stack the posture, as I talked about, the way we stack the posture is designed to transmit the force to primarily to a particular target. And I've talked about these are minor structural adjustments in the way that the posture is stacked will cause most of the power to be issued at one at one point. It's just very straightforward law of physics. It's not. It's nothing, it's nothing magical or anything like that. But I've said before, like in Tai Chi, you can visualize it as Chi going to one point if that, if that helps. If, I, if my idea is I want to hit with this heel to the, to the back like, like that, if I want to do, do it like that for whatever reason, or put the power in the leg primarily, I use this drop down into the, because it helps me to get this twist into the, it helps me to set the posture in a way that's pushing back off this leg. But if, if the hit point is here with the knee, but if the hit point isn't in this leg, the hit point's in this leg and it's the knee like that, the, the striking point, then I don't, I don't use this down posture. The way the posture stacks keeps me more, keeps me more upright like that, because now I'm using this springing up for one thing to generate more power into the posture. So it stacks differently, even though the foot does a very, very similar thing in the way that it, the way that it sets. That's all about just where are you primarily directing the issue in the force to. It's as simple as that, it's complicated as that. And like I keep saying, like, like don't over worry about it. Like it's really, really interesting intellectually to explain how this works. And it's really, really important to challenge these kind of magic power charlatans to explain the sophistication of real each one. But it's embodied knowledge and you just learn it through training. You could just learn it without ever conceptualizing it in any way. So don't worry, just practice. So pulls in like that. And very similar to before, we can just practice pulling the foot back, 
Well, I'd do it like that anyway, just like, just to train that, but then just training. And, it, and of course what it does, it, it pulls, as well as adding force into the, you know, it's pulling in that way, that's contributing to the far lead. Everything's adding more zing onto that, but it also pulls the foot in line so that it balances directly underneath. And it also helps to arc the, the roots back into the floor on a bit of an angle like that, so that the energy pushes back into the floor rather than pushing you back. So it does our key three things that we want with the with the, with the knee strike. And this foot just going to spring up off the floor like that. And again, just exactly as before, this knee and this hip are like two outliers around the the axis, but. You know, you could get you could get someone just holding that knee and someone holding the hip. They could go like that and pull back on the hip like that and make me move like that. But I've got to add in the 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 movement around the the virtual reality central axis. And all my muscles are using somatic timing, so you need the relaxation. So this is something that you see in other the cultivation in other people, other martial arts, but also within each one is the movement is very tense. They tense the to get the movement and I've said before that can be confused with whole body power because if you tense you feel your whole body so you think it's whole body power actually it's got to be relaxed and all the muscles have got to feel like these feel like they're going to fly off the bone that way and those feel like they're going to fly off the bone that way when we reach the lock point and we curtail the target curtail the strike at the the center line and we've just got to come up and round like that quite a minimal movement Mate, the more you bother me, the longer it'll take to get out on. We're going to go, don't worry, we're going to go in a minute. And again, pulling back like this, using this oppositional force. And even here, just using screwing force into the, into the posture like that. Every possible means of creating more volume compacted into a tiny space is, is utilised. It's all stored force and it's all being exploited by the intent. And only the intent is powerful enough as this supercomputer to work everything out. So we start very relaxed, like, up to the lock point. All right. And just practice like that. And we'll practice both ways. So we're not going to need to do things like that unless it's deliberately we're doing that deliberately. Practice both ways equally. And then we just start adding more power into the into the posture. See my arm coming up a little bit like that. So it's creating more volume into the movements. It cracks open all mysteries and it can also point out problems like that. I mean, that's a problem as far as I'm concerned because that's a tell if I'm lifting my arm up to do. And that's when Either you as an engaged learner or your coach has got to go, hold on a minute. I should start from here. No excess movement, complete teleportation. Focus on this arm's not going to come up to add more. It's just going to come straight down. <laughs> I still did it a bit. Right, I'm going to allow myself a little bit. I think it's okay. Right. And you can get, like it looks like nothing, but you know, there's videos of me needing a heavy bag. I can get real power out of it. So there's no, this isn't the kind of fantasy Chinese martial arts where everyone's dead embarrassed and like, you know, the next guy along does Muay Thai and they're needing a bag and you're like, oh yeah, but I use chi and uh, you've got to be sensitive to chi or it won't work. And you know, then you just go and hide in the changing rooms and convince yourself you're uh, whatever it is. It's not like that, it's not like that. This is like, you get on the bag and you hit it with real force, real power, and people are like, wow, how do you get that kind of power from such a small movement? That's when you're like, aha, it's not a small movement, it's not a small movement, it's a massive movement, but it's the volume of the movement is curtailed within a tiny little space. So let's move into that. This is all about, so moving on like one, two, into the next one like that. So we've looked at our idea of complementary routing where we go one, 
too like that. This is complementary routing, but it's a more sophisticated and more difficult way of doing that. Here, you can just rock. You can just rock. Jab into cross, complementary routing, highly sympathetic. Here, you've got a manufacture sympathy more in the complementary routing. And remember videos back, I said complementary routing and structural sympathy are not exactly the same thing, they overlap. Here, there's just so much structural sympathy. Here, I've got a drop and I've got to pull back like that into the posture. So I've got to manufacture more sympathy. But remember, I also said when you manufacture sympathy or when you lose sympathy in one area, you can gain it in another. So the ability to drop and pull back also adds force into the, the second knee, just like when we do it on the spot. So we want exactly the same. But as soon as we drop, the ball of the foot hits the floor and then we change straight away into the, into the back knee. And that's going to look like... And it's all pretty... I'm moving forward a little bit, but only a tiny little bit. I'm not, for example, going like that. You can do that. That's a little bit more... Like I say, it's more advanced because that to get power in that posture is more difficult and it's more dangerous in terms of the ask and the athleticism and it's much more of a flexibility thing, believe me, to get this big stretch like that. We want this first. Powerful movement in a short space, then we can think about more advanced stuff. This is advanced enough on its own. So. It's all in a short space. Mate. And again, we want it both ways. That feels to me slow but more powerful. My orthodox, my own orthodox. For me, that's orthodox because I'm left-handed, but it feels more powerful that way, faster the other way. So we one. As soon as it drops ball of the foot, then this is all about. The way it hits and the way it drops down, we can get like a little bit of up into the jump and it's absolutely fine to jump. And it's absolutely fine to leave the floor. If you do it with power on a bag and film yourself, you'll see that you leave the floor. For people who believe like that you draw power from the earth or something like that, that breaks a spiritual rule. For people who follow the laws of nature, in the way that your body does, even if your mind doesn't. It makes no difference if you leave the floor. The energy to leave the floor means that the energy is already there. That connection to the floor is there in the fact that you are accelerating from the floor. It's like a rocket taking off. So, one, two, three. Like that, a couple more times. You can get on the bag and try that, get on the pads and try that, no problem. So what changes then when we think about the straight knee? Yeah, there's a couple of basic kinds of knees. So like we've got three basic kicks, like front kick, round kick, side kick, and we know we've got other kicks as well, but we've got two basic knees. One is forward and one is round, and we've kind of just looked around. So what changes when we do, do a front kick? So the main thing is the way that the quad moves. So for the for this movement here, we want it to come up, up and round like that into the posture, obviously. Whereas here, we want it to come straight through. We want it to come straight through like that. And what do you think changes there? So when we do it like that, as opposed to, can you see in my movement, can you see the difference? I'm thinking about everything that we've learned about before. There's a difference in the way that I'm releasing force. For the posture that comes round like this, I'm turning much more around my axis to generate to generate force. One, two, like that. It's highly structurally sympathetic to that, obviously. I don't want to keep my body forwards and then do a kick like that. Like, like if you're going to use this kind of movement. I mean, you can, of course, do that. So... As ever, there's always different ways of doing movements that are within the structural movement paradigm. It might be the right call here, and you've just got to do that for whatever reason. 
But we always begin by thinking about how do we generate the most power for the smallest seeming movement. So, one, we do that by going around the axis like that. If I go forward, obviously I lose this. All this extra articulation that creates power, just even just this little bit of coming up and around like that, is creating more power. When you increase the speed, it exponentially increases the power some. And here, it's just going to come straight through. So you don't have this same wind up like that. And when you do it slowly, you don't even need to do like that to come through like that. You can just come through off the spot like that. And what we have to do is make decisions about what's the benefit, like what's the best thing that we can maximize out of this. So if I've got to come straight through like that, that's faster. That's faster with, there's less articulated movement leading up into it. I can, of course I can do that and get some articulated movement into it. But, but doesn't really add that much to it in the way that this does. It swings it up and around like that. You see the whole body articulate into it. And the most important thing is the way we generate force this way isn't usually just going around the, the axis like that. It's a compound movement between going around the axis and leaning forward, just like we do when we do kicks like that. So when we do a kick and we, it's exactly the kind of the uh, power generation that comes from the horizontal axis in Shingy Chuan, it's exactly that. Only, only we can add in now, we can, there is some turn around the axis, but the quad, and the quad's gonna really open flat like that. So it's not just, it's not gonna be like that where the quad is flat on the hip point, the quad is gonna turn and push in, just like with a kick, it turns and pushes in like that. This is really important means in which we, which we generate, generate power, same with kicks. Getting a quad flat across. It doesn't have to be completely flat, by the way, like that. But broadly speaking, it flattens in a line like that, in line with the, the strike. So it's going to come straight through, and then the body is going to both lean forward and it's going to twist. So it's going to do a, a compound movement like that between horizontal, farly and rotational fairly like that. It's gonna it's gonna come straight through. Oh and the next thing we need is we wanna we wanna push up explosively on the back foot and then as this foot comes back imagine this foot coming back and you can practice like the foot comes back and lift this foot and think like headbutt because this this kind of Horizontal axis fairly. It's never completely horizontal. I know usually it's not usually completely flat. It's always on an angle anyway. So it's always a compound with the with this this rotational axis. We can think like headbutt is always like that's the movement that absolutely maximizes, and also the weight of the head doing that like actually adds extra force into the movement. It adds extra extra momentum into the into the movement. So we can think like, just like practicing like that. It's very much like, and this foot just comes back in the same way like that, like that, and just practicing into the headbutt like that. Very relaxed, because I can give you a neck ache, I'm telling you. And that is very much the movement that we want. We just then stick the knee out higher and just open the quad and push the knee forwards into the into the target. And what we should see that's a little bit different to a kick, like if you go back and look at those four that I did, I can, I mean, no one's, no one's ever doing it right all the time. It's, it's not about that. It's about being able to understand your own body movement and feel what was right, what was wrong. The first one that I did, my foot dropped a lot faster because my balance wasn't right. I was leaning too far forwards. That's what we want with a kick. We want it to drop down like that. If you're getting the, the knee right, it should be able to just hold it like that. There's no 
the lean forward isn't as, as pronounced. Oh, the leg's not out as far anyway, so it's not pushing, pulling you down. If it is, then you've probably overextended and over leaned into the posture. So we want to feel like you've actually got to pull the foot down rather than it just falling down. That's a really good tip so that you know you've got the, just the right, just the right distance for this kind of off the spot pop up. Like that. And we can see that when we go around like this, we can get quite a lot of oppositional force with the pulling the arms back like that. When we do it with the flat knee, that comes straight back like, like that. You can visualize pulling someone in. You can feel in the posture itself, there's less screwing force in it for one thing, so it's a much smaller movement, even though it looks a similar size. It's this principle again, if I pull around like that with screwing force, that's a bigger movement than just doing that even though they look like the same size movement. Screen force doubles up movement, so. Pull back a little bit like that. It just adds a little bit of that kind of oppositional force. At the same time, you kind of head, head body forward like that, and then you're down like that. So practice quite relaxed. And down like that, and then start bringing your speed. Like that. Bob's your uncle. That's the front knee anyway. We were doing the back knee, weren't we? So back knee, exactly the same. It's exactly the same posture. It's just it's just bigger in terms of so you can get a little bit more power in there. Like that. And similarly, if we want to do if we want to do two, we just like that. It tends not to be quite as much pulling back. It's just a little bit of a pull back into the into the second knee like that. Like that. And try them. Like to holistically train, try them just absolutely off the spot. Teleportation. Try them moving around in kind of jam move kind of movement. And then try them just like like you fight. And just try them like that and try them at different speeds, different power levels. Then use the multiplier effect. Think about how you link things together so we can we can go round into the one, two, three. Remember, just like when we looked at kicks, one, you can land it a little bit, a little bit favourable to that, but in reality, that's not that helpful because we want to get up to this point. So we actually want this space one, two, three, to get up into this. So we usually don't do it like that. If we're going to go for the, keep it pretty much flat down. Um, you can conceivably go right like that. And you can practice like that as well. So all these different variations. But just off the spot, we go pretty, keep it pretty tight into the, into the posture. That's perfectly valid. Um, or even doing it as a three point. Like into the one, two side kick into the, into the, like that, something like that, to practice your articulation of kicks. Then everything else is just about variations of height and footwork. Well, I we can say it's that simple, but it's not that simple, so really good, like, knee technique, right into the, right into the thigh. And for that, we use down, we drop our weight down much, much more like that, drop, you just practicing them really, really well, into the thigh, low kicks like that, if we get higher kicks, higher knees I should say, using a little bit more jumping, more up, you don't get more up than actually jumping, so remember jumping is up as well, so, okay. Trying to get a little bit more, a little bit more height on it. Visualizing, you know, grab the head in for the knee, something like that. And we can use all our usual footwork that we've looked at, but there's some that we haven't quite looked at in the same way or to the same degree. That we can that we can look at now. We'll look at them in terms of knees because they're really useful for knees, but 
they apply to the other kicks as well. So the first is just to shuffle back the whole thing like whole body like that, like a kind of sprawl. And then the one from here, you want to spring back straight into the knee. Like someone's gone for a takedown or something like that. They've not done it very well. We move back and change into the into the knee like that. And, and the key, the key here is here. So we bounce back into the bounce back into the kickback route. Really. That bounces us straight back into the boing boing. Like that. Bounces us straight back into the the knee strike. Like that. Like that. Well, this is far lead and it's a well, the movement far lead. Both are far lead. It's not stepping them. It's not step and do it like that. Like that. Can do it like that. But we want it for very fast, powerful structural movement in both. Yeah, you can do both. You can just be like, you know, you can, you can change like that. But we want our, ex our steps to be explosive anyway. So once we start getting engaged with explosive steps, everything is explosive, everything is farly. So both of these movements are farly. Changing to the other leg from the same. So I'm doing a couple of different variations there, I reckon. So one is like straight back like that but we can also do back from the front leg the other way like that so can go back one similar sort of sprawl concept similar bounce concept one two and then into the into the round the round knee like that the side knee so if we are this way one, like that you be careful slipping on the floor all these things will happen when you use techniques like this. Slip on something. So we're getting right out of the way. See the structural sympathy for the... Because my foot's already out like that, so we can just bounce straight in. It's already on the line like that. And this is like just our usual triangle step out and then it bounces back into the... Push. So we can do front leg, one, two, or we can do front leg all goes back, or front leg goes back, creates more room, creates more volume, can use that springy force to create more power, but it also extends the time, but it doesn't matter, does it? as long as it hits, or we can a little bit more, a little bit more challenging at first for the mind. We can go from the front leg or the back leg, so like that. Just pull back. Or same posture but back leg, so. Like that, same posture but back leg. Or we can do, we can do like, one and then like front leg like that should be a little bit more discombobulating for the, for the brain and when we're going to go for the we're going to change the back leg into the front leg so what we do is usually we don't we don't do too big a, even if it comes back like that it's very often just flat on like like that. Obviously you don't have time to, you don't always have time to think about that. Something the intense got to figure. But flat a sprawl like that. And then that leg can change. Into that. Like that. Just like that. And then finally, it's not final, there's so many different kind of knee new things we could look at but for now one final thing which is retreating retreating with knees because knees are really good for retreating so just adding in more so the most basic one we do is step back step back and then into the into the knee so you move out of the way trash so go like that but one two skip back Skip back into the knee. Just look at it. 
Do it slower so you can see. One, two, three. See, this is only a very brief. It's like when we do that in the in most of it. We're only here for a second. Here for a second as we as we change like that. It's always going to be vulnerable points, you know. It's, it's predictability. If you see that your opponent's always doing that, then it becomes a predictable thing that you can pick up on. But usually it's, it's far too slow. Similarly meant to say. So one, two, like that. We'll just look at this one today because there's a few in the complex so like that. So we're moving quite a lot of, quite a lot of space out of the way. Or someone's coming rushing in like that quite low. Yeah. You change. Um, and you can do it the same way with the getting it round like that. Round from the from the back into the side of the head. Like that. And the other initial basic variation we need on that is just to do the same thing from the from the front leg. So from one, two into the into the posture. And you've really got to get that bouncing it to compensate for but because everything's moving back it's quite hard to change the direction back going the other way with force and the way you do that is just the way that you hit with the the kickback the kickback so it just goes boing and boings you back the other way this very bouncy springy movement that's the way you change direction not just change direction but forcefully so that's the hardest thing you're moving back and I want to go forward with I want to go forward with power how do you do that that's why you do like um, when you see people talking about oh you don't don't do pivot rooting and stuff like that how would you do this then like it's so flat footed and to try and make you change back like that so this is obviously obviously the best way of doing it so right. I'm just changing the like that and the same for round And that's knees. That's our basic knees. There's loads of other knees stuffed up. We need to look at. Got to get the dog out on a walk before it starts biting me. Um, that's a basic introduction to knees and knee strikes. Also helps us understand a lot of other things about. I'm not sure I explained it all. Hopefully, as the videos add up, that we looked around articulated force and creating volume in a small area, and understanding this idea: biggest amount of force for the smallest movement isn't about magic powers. It's about this, the science of this. It's what all of this is. Articulated force, creating more. It's what this is. It explains everything. It's what this is. You know, when people do that with a big, it's all the same. It's all the same thing, but looked at in different ways. Where do I put the movement? Do I put it here or do I put it here? You, know, you can put that big movement in different parts of the body and keep a similar power level. So hopefully that, for now anyway, begins to explain some of those points. Yes, I know. I'm wrapping up, I'm wrapping up. Um, one love, come and say one love. One love. One love from me, one love from him. Thanks very much for watching as ever. If you want to leave a comment so that I know <laughs> I'm not alone. That would be great. Thanks very much. I'll see you in the next one.